Hello, I'm Dana Marie Kennedy from AARP Arizona. Thank you for joining us today. And I want to welcome you to this important discussion about the coronavirus. AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization, has been working to promote in the face of this global pandemic, AARP has been providing information and resources to help older adults and those caring for them. I think we're all grateful that 2020 is in the rearview mirror. COVID, of course, is still with us and will be for some time. But 2021 holds the promise of a broad vaccine distribution across the country. Yet just a few weeks into the new year, major challenges remain. The virus has mutated and continues to out to have outbreaks nationwide, shown just how difficult prevention efforts can be. And while the vaccines are on the way, distribution has been slow, and many Americans continue to feel the emotional and financial hardship from the pandemic and fears about what is to come. Today, we're looking ahead and we'll hear from Dr. Ross Goldberg, President of the Arizona Medical Association and Vice Chair of Surgery and Specialty Ambulatory Medical Director at Valleywide. Health in Phoenix, and Dr. Leonard Kirshner, retired Air Force Colonel and past Access Director, about how we can combat COVID together and the latest about the vaccine distribution. If you've participated in one of our teletown halls, you know this is similar to a radio talk show, and you have the opportunity to ask questions live. For those of you joining us on the phone, if you would like to ask a question about the coronavirus pandemic, press star three on your telephone to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue to ask that question live. If you're listening through our Facebook live stream, please leave your question in the comment section. We've had folks join us on the call and I've been speaking and I want to extend a welcome. I'm Dana Kennedy with AARP Arizona and I wanna thank you for joining this important discussion, discussion on the global coronavirus pandemic. We are talking with lead, leading experts and taking your questions live. First, we'll have Dr. Ross Goldberg, Medical Director, President of the Arizona Medical Association. Ross Goldberg, MD, FACS, is the District Medical Group Vice Chair and Surgery and Special Ambulatory Medical Director at Valleywise Health in Phoenix. He's an Associate Professor of Surgery at both Creighton University School of Medicine and the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix. He's been active in surgical advocacy and health policy at the state, local, and federal level for over 21 years, holding multiple positions in numerous organizations. Currently, he's the president of the Arizona Medical Association, the largest independent physician organization in the state of Arizona. I'll now go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Goldberg. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, good morning to everyone who's joined us. Uh, I'm going to be very brief, which for those who know me will be a, a stretch, but I'll do my best here. And just I'm going to quickly go over kind of platforms that are out there right now so we can move forward and get to your questions. Just to go over everything again, the type of vaccines that are available right now from Pfizer and Moderna are something called messenger RNA vaccines. Well, what on earth are those? If you think about it, messenger RNA is a message that's sent uh, to help build proteins in the body. So what this vaccine targets is something called the spike protein in the coronavirus. The spike protein is what the coronavirus uses to get into your cell and start causing trouble. So what, we, what they have done is created this blueprint for your cell to realize that the protein is foreign material and to build up antibodies to it. So what basically happens is, and there's a lot of ways to do it, but think of your messenger RNA. I'm a big Lego guy. So think of it like a set of Lego instructions. The Lego instructions are given to the cell. It has to organize and put things together in a certain order in a particular way and it builds the protein. And then all of a sudden, like that Mission Impossible message, it goes away once it's done its job. Now that you have this protein, your body knows it's foreign. So you build up antibodies to that protein so that if you were to were exposed to it again, you'd start fighting things off. That's what the vaccine does. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine both have the same kind of method on, on doing this. The difference is for you, are minimal, but mostly when it comes to timing. The, the both of them are two shot vaccines. So one's a primer, the second one's a booster. The first, the visor one's done uh, between 21 days. So the first one and 21 days later, the Moderna is 28 days later. Really, there's a little bit of difference on what's made up on how to create the vaccine. The big thing logistically on our side is how to store the vaccine, as you probably heard. 
Pfizer needs ultra cold storage, which is not readily available throughout the state versus Moderna, which could use the regular refrigerators. So from a logistics standpoint, you may be getting Moderna or Pfizer just because you can store one in one place and not the other. Does it really make a difference between which one you get, Pfizer or Moderna? From your perspective, not really. The efficacy is between 95% for Pfizer and 94.5% for Moderna. So as I like to say, an A is an A, so they're both pretty good. For the rest of that, we'll get to it, I'm sure, through your questions regarding uh, responses, reactions, things like that. I will tell you, as, as a frontline healthcare worker, I have gotten both Pfizer vaccines, uh, both my shots did fine. I have my card here. For those who followed on social media, I actually did a 28-day kind of daily diary of how I was doing. Uh, so I am a believer in it, obviously. I practice what I preach. I do have antibodies confirmed, so the, the vaccine worked. And with that, I will kick it back over and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Lynn Kirshner, retired Colonel Air Force and past president of AARP Arizona and past director of Access in Arizona, Dr. Kirshner. Lynn, we can't hear you. Lynn? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yeah, uh, I'm having trouble getting uh, feedback on the screen. I'm going to get out of here. And that's the studio. Uh, it was just giving me feedback, uh, two, two voices. Anyway, uh, Dr. Goldberg gave you a really good overview of mRNA. You know, we're one year out from the uh, first uh, cases arriving in Arizona. And since then, we've had uh, hundreds of thousands and 12,000 12, deaths. A year ago, most people thought that getting a vaccine in a year was impossible. Although there were those that had been working on this technology for the past 10 to 15 years who thought it was possible. Getting two vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, in less than one year since the, uh, since the virus was uh, discovered has been a medical miracle. I have my first shot, getting my second one on the 6th, and so I'm looking forward to getting that second one. I'm also a believer in vaccines, uh, going back to uh, polio, smallpox, and all the many vaccinations I took during my 22 years in the Air Force. So let's go to questions. I think that's the important part. Thank you, Dr. Kirshner. Again, if you have just joined the call, I'm Dana Marie Kennedy from AARP Arizona, and this is a live teletown hall to talk about the latest developments with the coronavirus and the news about the vaccine distribution plans in Arizona. We're talking with Dr. Ross Goldberg and Dr. Lynn Kirshner. As I stated earlier, this is an interactive call, so if you would like to ask a question at any time during the call, press star three on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue. The sooner you press star three, the sooner you'll be online with our guests. If you're listening through our Facebook live stream, please leave your question in the comment section. As we proceed, members, remember if you would like to ask a question, press star three. I'll now go ahead and ask a polling question really quickly. Will you be vaccinated? Press one for yes, press two for no, and press three for not sure. Again, the polling question is, will you be vaccinated? Press one for yes, two for no, and three for not sure yet. And I will now turn it over to Alex Wada, our AARP Arizona Communications Director for participant questions. Alex. Can't hear you. You're on mute, Alex. There we go. My apology. It. What would it be? A, a Zoom call or an, an, one of these uh, virtual calls without not muting our microphone. So my apology. Thank you, Dana, and welcome to our listeners and also our Facebook Live uh, viewers. Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Kirshner, thank you so much for being here with us today. We have uh, many questions that are coming in, so we are going to go right ahead and get started here. First, we are going to go live. To Margaret. Margaret is in Green Valley. Margaret, can you hear us? I'm on for her. I'm her husband, Ron. Oh, 
Oh, this is Ron. Thank you, Ron. Go ahead. I uh, I can hear barely hear you, but I'm on for my wife Margaret. Uh, my name is Ron. Go ahead with your question, Ron. My question was is that we're my wife and I are both my wife and I are both in our 80s and we have been trying to find a place where we can get signed up for a vaccination and we're having no luck here in Arizona. We live just south of Tucson in Green Valley. Okay. So Ron and his wife, uh, they're both having trouble signing up for vaccines. Any recommendations, uh, Dr. Ross Goldberg? Yeah, that's that's been an ongoing problem. It's, it's logistics have been the kind of the, the Achilles heel of this whole process. They they made the vaccine. The trick is getting it into people's arms. Uh, down in, in Tucson and Pima County, now they are just tuned up. Now there were two main sites that were giving it out. Now the U of A is opening a third main pod down there. So what you should do is reach out to the, the Pima County Medical, uh, the Pima County uh, uh, Health Departments. They're the ones helping to coordinate. Um, you also can also, there's a website that the Arizona Department of Health Services has put out. If you go to azdhs.gov, they have a whole coronavirus section. There's actually a vaccine map now where you can find places that are giving the vaccines. One thing that's being expanded to is they're also gonna be giving it to some of the pharmacies now like Albertsons, Kroger, things like that, are gonna be getting doses if not gotten them already. So there's gonna be expanded areas in which you can get the vaccine. But if you go onto that website, the azdhs.gov, if not, well, what I can do is uh, make sure we go through ARP. I have a number, I don't have it on me right now, that you can call if the website's not working, like an 844 number to help as well sign up it. for vaccines. So we do perfect. So we, we have those couple options right now. But definitely if the, 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 the state website doesn't work, I'd reach out to the Pima County Health Department as well. So there are two different options for phone numbers to call. Um, you can call 1-844-542-8201. That's 1-844-542-8201. We realize many seniors do not have access to the internet and can only call, so you do need to be patient. You can also call 211. Um, they'll also connect you as well. But be patient. Um, just remember, this vaccine came very early, and everybody wants it, and we are working, you know, they're working on getting it out, but we're just going to have to remain patient and vigilant. So thank you. Dana? Thank you, Dana. It's good. Yeah, okay. it's good. Okay. It's good news and bad news. The good news is the vaccine was developed in an incredibly short period of time. The bad news is getting it into the arms of people is hard to do, and so be patient. Um, it, it will happen, and I think the logjam will break sometime in the next couple of weeks. But clearly, there's been a lot of frustration with a lot of people trying to get their vaccine set up um, be patient, keep trying, it will work. Thank you, Dr. Kirshner. Now we are gonna go live to Mesa, and in Mesa we have uh, Shirley. Shirley, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead, please. Well, I'm in the 80 plus category, and I have a son who lives with me that is 63, but has a lot of uh, health issues and that, but for us to drive an hour to go to the uh, State Farm Stadium is just out of the question and that I don't do well on the freeway anymore and, and I would just like to know when the governor is going to start opening up either the Walmarts, as they have done in seven other states I heard today, or when we are going to have access to the vaccine and that like at CVS or at Fry's or somewhere like that? Very good, great question. Yeah, I'll pass on uh, Ross, you've been, yeah, Ross, you've been following that pretty carefully here. Uh, fire away. Yeah, I'm sure I'm happy to do, do my best. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately in my role, 
I have been speaking with the state frequently on a very, this is a very relevant question, an important one, because yes, how do we get it out to larger groups who can't make it to these big pods? So there is a plan in place. So just a little history, believe it or not, the way this data is set up through its statutes, originally it was a requirement that the counties be responsible for the vaccine distribution. In the last couple of weeks, seeing that the vaccine distribution was a little slow, the governor instituted an executive order giving the state the ability to step in and help, which is how you see that state farm site set up and things like that. Now, I mentioned earlier, I think places like Kroger's and Albertson, they're going to start getting that vaccine. The pharmacy is going to start getting them. What happened is, is that those pharmacies are set up through the CDC on the federal level. When the state was getting ready to set all this up, the CDC asked them to keep them in that federal network and not have them on board on the state. Well, obviously there was a few hiccups because they wanted to do these earlier, get them in the pharmacies earlier. So they've been onboarding these pharmacies now. So you should start seeing a larger distribution go out to these pharmacy sites. Again, I point people to that AZDHS website because they're gonna really pinpoint all the locations right now. And that's going to grow. We have advocated for as many places as possible to get it. One of the holdups is again, is the amount of vaccines available. Uh, we are slowly learning about what the federal government has and does not have yet and what they can get to us. And that is also having an impact on where they're going. But you're absolutely right. There needs to be places where people can go very quickly and get it done. And also I know in the federal government's plan to try to move things forward under the new administration, talking about things like mobile units and things like that to get to you so you don't have to get to them to get the shot. So all that is underway. Again, as Dr. Kirchner said, logistics, you know, we, everyone talked a good game, but the logistics behind this are just massive. And there are some hiccups that they're figuring out as we move forward. Yeah, Ross, we've got 7.2 million in the state. Uh, if you actually give everyone two shots, 14 plus million shots, um, massive undertaking. I think we've done at this point about 350,000 shots. Uh, got a long way to go. Now, for the caller, if you have a local pharmacy that you use regularly, call them. Many of them are now making a list of their regular customers, and they will call them when the vaccine is available and give you a time to come in. So if you use CVS or Walgreens or one of those, or Safeway or one of the, uh, uh, the larger uh, stores, give them a call to your pharmacy, give them your name, tell them what you need, and many of them are now setting up call lines and will call you back. Thank you, Dr. Kirshner. And um, Dr. Goldberg, uh, one more time, if possible, because there's a lot of questions about the getting vaccines at the pharmacies. When might that happen again? Well, so my understanding is that they've started to distribute out to the pharmacies, I think this week, if I'm not mistaken. So you should start seeing that. And again, it all depends how much they're getting each week. They're getting it week by week. But again, I point people to that uh, state website that has the current locations of where the vaccines are being held. Um, we can follow up. I can follow up after the call as well with DHS and get back to you exactly when other sites are going up. But my understanding both Albertsons and Kroger's are some of the locations across the state that are going to be getting, I think, 5,000 doses each was the number I heard most recently. Yeah, and Ross, 5,000 5, doses, and we need 14,000 shots, uh, 14 million shots. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the old story that uh, the demand is exceeding the supply by uh, a factor of 10 or more. Right, but also, and to remind all the listeners, too, we're, right now we're only talking about two vaccines. The hope and plan as more vaccines come out, it'll be distributed to a larger group, the, the Johnson & Johnson, the AstraZeneca, the Novavax vaccines that are coming down the pipeline. The government actually planned for that and bought a variety of doses for each one. So people will be getting different vaccines as they become available, which will also exponentially increase access to vaccines. Yeah, and the Johnson & Johnson, they should be going in for uh, a authorization sometime in the next two weeks. It'll be a, a one dose rather than the two doses for Pfizer and Moderna. Exactly. That will definitely help. We are going to go to Tucson this time, and we have Sandra. Sandra, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead with your question, please. This is Michael. Go ahead. This is Michael. Hey, Michael. Uh, Sandra or Michael? Uh-huh. 
Yeah, the question was, uh, he's been quarantined since March. He's paralyzed. He's on long-term mercy care. He has a doctor that comes once a month, gives him his flu shot and that sort of thing. Will she also be provided with the vaccine um, for a, the way the flu shot is and bring it to him the way she does once a month and give him that vaccine shot? That's a great question. question. Um, I don't know the logistics of that, but that's exactly pointing to the issues that, that everyone has to deal with, that there are people that can't get to these sites and we need to bring the vaccines to them. Uh, what I can do is remind DHS, I know that's in the plan. The question is, I personally do not know what their logistics are for doing that. Uh, in theory, that's what should be done. Um, it's easy for me to say that. I don't have to make the decisions on that, but I can recommend that that's what they should do. Um, so I will follow up with, uh, with DHS. I, again, I talk to them every week and point out that we have members of this state that can't get anywhere and they need to have the vaccine literally brought to their doorstep. So absolutely, I think that needs to be part of their plans. For those who can't go anywhere, who are quarantined, they need to have the vaccine come to them. And right now it's a two-shot deal. Um, and then hopefully after that, you won't need anything for a while. Is he on Altair? Excellent. If, if, they're, if they're on Altex, I do know that the access director is working on a plan to be able to get the vaccine um, directly to people who are on Altex. Um, but it's probably, it's not, you know, going to happen within the next month, but it is, they're working on it. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go live to Tucson. And this time we have Alan that has a question about masks. Yes, I've heard that uh, N95 masks are particularly effective. Uh, also, uh, that the KN95 or uh, those labels that's coming from China uh, may not be effective at all. Uh, some comment on that, as well as what I could expect uh, to pay for a good N95 mask and where I might find it. Well. I take this one. Uh, as a surgeon, I'm used to wearing masks all the time, unfortunately or fortunately. You're right. The N95 is kind of that the, the top one for a variety of reasons. The way it's constructed, there's actually an electrostatic charge in it as well that grabs particles. Um, Pre-pandemic, you could really should only have to pay around $5 for an N95 mask, believe it or not. They shouldn't be that expensive. They are difficult to find right now because the majority are going to the healthcare workers since of our exposure rate. The KN95s are effective. There are masks that are effective, just not as effective as the N95. The KN95s are okay. And one actually I've been recently asked about is this concept, if you've been watching anything in Washington recently, is this concept of double masking. Now, we don't say go around doing this all the time, but if you're in an area where you may be around more people than normal, having two masks, like the surgical mask and the cloth mask over it or something like that, also provides enough layers to help slow things down. The N95 is the best. Uh, KN95s are okay. They're NIOSH approved. There's a whole series of proofs they have to go through. Uh, but the N95s right now, until more are made, and the hope is more are going to be made through the Defense Production Act that everyone can get one. But the KN95s do a good job. It is a combination of things, mask wearing, social distancing, all of that that work. But yes, the N95s are the best out there, but they're mostly in uh, the healthcare settings right now for the healthcare workers who are exposed to COVID on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. And uh, Len, there was a follow-up question that came in about the uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. When it would be approved in Arizona? I believe you mentioned it would be one to two weeks, approximately. Yeah Dr. Fauci, yeah, Dr. Fauci this weekend was opining that the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine will probably get emergency uh, authorization within the next two weeks, which is estimate. Uh, they have already produced, from what I understand, uh, 100 million doses. So they will be distributed fairly rapidly. Uh, then it will be up to the federal government sending it to the states, sending it to the counties, distributing it. But I would assume that February is going to be a golden month for vaccination in both in uh, the state and in the country. Uh, but we're going to have to be patient. The next couple of weeks are still going to be slow, but I really feel that by the end of February into March, we're going to start reaching a point where supply is reaching the demand and we'll be far better off than we were, uh, say, this week 
and uh, for the frustrations of those people who have tried to get online, get an appointment, and have had so much difficulty. And I feel for them. And I just want to echo uh, the keyword there is. Go ahead, Dr. Goldberg. Okay, I just wanted to follow up that uh, just so people understand, the reason why it's taking a little longer is that the requirement for the FDA is that you have at least two months post injection to monitor for any side effects. That's what happened with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. So if you watch that timeline, as Dr. Hirschner said, by the end of this month is that two month window. So the data starts coming in. The hope is the data looks good. And another thing that not just Johnson & Johnson, these other companies did was a parallel process. They made vaccines before they got all the results back because they were that confident in their vaccine. But that way, once the data was in, it looked good, they were ready to go. So exactly, you're gonna see the data coming in the next couple of weeks. It will go to an EUA application for the FDA. They'll take their week or so to review it. And if they're okay with it, yes, as soon as they say yes and the CDC says yes, they're out the door and hopefully in people's arms. But that's going to be the same process for AstraZeneca and Novavax, which are going through their trials right now. Yeah, and the good news is Warp Speed has done a number of things really well, a couple of things like distribution, not so well. But one of the things they did was say to the pharmaceutical companies, we will buy a substantial portion of your vaccine development, even if it doesn't prove to work. And so the supplies are there because it's already been developed. Uh, that was a decision made at the federal government that was the correct one. And uh, so we can expect to have far more vaccines available in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I'm hoping that we can reach that uh, 75 to 80 percent immunization level around Arizona, around the, the country, sometime in the first half of this year into the summer. Uh, we still have the whole issue of those that don't want to take the vaccination, the anti-vaxxers. And when I went to State Farm to get my shot uh, about eight days ago, the anti-vaxxers were out with their signs. Uh, vaccinations are a great asset for healthcare. They're the most amazing things we've done in healthcare. Ross, it's better than surgery. I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They've been amazing, but you know you can go back and the anti-vaxxers were out in 1706 in Boston when uh, uh, they were proposing to vaccinate uh, the uh, the children in a smallpox outbreak. So uh, anti-vaxxers have been around for a long time. And talking about uh, immunization levels, uh, Dana, we have our poll results and we have. 82% of the uh, people polled said, yes, they will take the vaccine. 4% said, no, I will not take it. And 14% said, I'm not sure yet. So Dr. Kirshner, Dr. Goldberg, what can we tell folks if they're in the fence, how can we assure them it's gonna be safe for them? First of all, the numbers you just got are so much better than the national statistics coming out from Kaiser and Pew and the other uh, polling companies. Uh, what we need to do is convince them that the vaccine is safe and effective. That's important. And it's the right thing to do for you, for your family, for your neighbors, and for humanity. And uh, it is uh, clearly uh, a public health education process. Uh, as you know, I like to write op-eds, Lotus Theater, and I've gotten a couple recently about why they should get their uh, their vaccine. But it is a major effort to convince those that are reluctant to understand this is what they should do. And I think also if That's you see people you know get it and they're doing okay, that also helps. So again, I like I said, I got to get mine on TV. I did mine with a press conference with, with Dr. Chris and a few others. Um, so I really kind of put myself out there. But again, to prove that it's okay, I was okay doing that. I didn't feel like a guinea pig. I knew the data. I, the phase three trials were done. So I was willing to show and demonstrate. I will tell you, even at an impact in my hospital, I had people come up to me that were a little concerned. They weren't sure, healthcare workers, who felt more comfortable because they saw me and then saw me every day. You know, I didn't grow a third arm. I didn't you know, have a, a reaction to it. Uh, you know, we laugh, but I've been asked, so many questions about what could happen. You know, I joke saying I'm waiting for my superpower to kick in, So you can argue I now have COVID-19 antibodies, so there's my superpower. But, you know, there is concern and it's okay to be hesitant and want to ask some information. 
I am not going to force someone to inject something in their body they're not comfortable doing. My job is to demonstrate, explain, and show as much as I can to make you feel comfortable to want to get it. So if I can do it by being a model and just showing how I did and being honest and upfront with how I'm doing, my hope is that will make people feel more comfortable in getting it themselves. Yeah, Ross, uh, the op that I did on, on, the, on the vaccine was printed in a couple of local newspapers, West Valley View and The Independent. And so I've gotten calls from neighbors and friends asking me about that. Same thing. When I tell them that I've gotten the shot and my wife's gotten the shot, that makes them feel more comfortable. Yes, thank you. We are going to go to Goodyear. And in Goodyear, we have uh, Beverly. Beverly, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Go ahead, please. Uh, my question was, um, I had my first COVID shot on the 11th, and the only appointment I could get for the second shot uh, has, it was, it has been on the 31st, which is 20 days rather than tw 21 days. Is that a critical difference, or does it not matter? You know, that's an interesting question, but clearly there is some evidence now that getting it uh, uh, in excess of that 21 days. I take it you got the Pfizer shot at, uh, at the yes. State Farm uh, Stadium. Yeah. Yes. You should get the Pfizer shot and preferably get it at 21 days, but if that's not available, uh, certainly within uh, those that six-week window is uh, what they're saying is possible. I know, but mine is early, yeah. not after. Half a day earlier shouldn't make a difference either. Uh, Actually, okay, you know, I mean, I know we get, we get very specific about these and we appreciate everyone following it. Uh, in medicine, as with anything, we have a little bit of wiggle room usually uh, with these things. So you should be fine. Uh, I don't expect that for something like that. I don't think you need to worry. Um, if it was a month apart, like an extra month on top of it, that's a different story. But a half a day should not make a difference. I can tell you, you know, I got mine earlier. The second shot was I got it like 12 hours earlier than the first shot and I was still fine. Okay, thank you for saying, yeah, no. a little bit of a worry word here. Thank you. No, it better be thank safe you, Reverend, sorry. I completely question. agree with you. Absolutely. We are going to move up to uh, northern Arizona. We're going to go to Mojave County, and we have Carol on the line. Carol, can you hear us? Hello, uh, my name's Carol, and uh, I signed up for the COVID back at the uh, local community college, and they accepted my signature. I'm 74 years old. And I found out today after calling the county health department, because I just heard through Scuttlebutt, that they say they're only in phase one. And because I'm not 75, I'm not getting a shot. And I know the regular regulations from the state is 65 and above. So that's very confusing. And it, for many of my friends, I'm about 40 miles from where I get the shot. They're going to show up and say they can't get a shot. So I'm wondering what, what the problem is there, and can it be straightened that's, out? <laughs> that, that's a great question, and that's where the whole state-county issue comes in. So you're right. The CDC recommendation is saying let's go to 65 and older and expand it out. The counties, though, kind of hesitated with it. The reason was supply issues. So the counties want to go to the 65 and older. I know many counties, including here in Maricopa, they were hesitant at first to go below 75, because of the amount of vaccine they have available. So really it all depends on what they have available. So it's a smart thing you did by calling. They may be hedging things right now because of what's coming. And until we can get them a better number, what we will do is again, I, like I said, I speak with DHS every week. We also reach out to the counties uh, specifically through ARMA. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. reach out to them and see also let them know. And we will try to let ARP know when we get information regarding what vaccine numbers are getting and how. I think they're still figuring out what the doses are going to be. But that's why some of the confusion occurred. The states, the counties waited, even though the state said it was okay, because they were worried mm -hmm. about supply issues. So there's no, yeah. uh, so the governor's jurisdiction doesn't cover what counties want to do, is what you're telling me. Well, it's so the, the, the by statute, the counties are ultimately in charge. He expanded okay. the role of the state in the executive order. But again, uh -huh. the counties also know how many shots they have. So they don't want to promise and schedule all these people for shots, like you said, and show up and there's no shots available. So they, they mm -hmm. are rationing things based on what they have available, but we can try to find out how they can get extra uh, vaccines up there to expand it so that you can get your shot. Thank you, Carol, for it's, the question. Carol, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. 
15 counties, and each one has its own health department, and they're all doing it in slightly different ways. That is correct. We are going to come uh, back to Phoenix, and in Phoenix, we have Bernice. Bernice, can you hear us? Yes, I can. <clears throat> My question was... Ellen, go ahead with your question. If you've had the virus before, can you catch it again? Uh, why could, what can you do to prevent from getting it again? Great question. That is an outstanding... That's a great question. The answer is, we're not 100% sure. But it appears if you've had COVID-19 one time, you have antibodies, and you're probably not going to get it a second time. However, there have been case reports of individuals having been diagnosed with COVID once sometime earlier in the year and getting a second uh, uh, infection. But that's rare. Uh, the chances are that if you had a case, you were symptomatic, that you do have antibodies, and that you will be okay. But even if you had it once, you should still get the COVID vaccine. Yeah, they're, they're question, saying Bernice, the, thank you. The, with the vaccine or even exposure, we don't know how long those antibodies last, and we're finding the vaccine antibodies are stronger and they last longer theoretically than the ones from the natural infection. So like Dr. Kirschner said, even if you've had the, the, the I've already been exposed to the virus, you should still consider getting the vaccine because uh, that will help boost your immune system. Uh, there are possibilities of getting it again. I mean, the one thing I tell people is you don't want to find out that you could do that and be the person that figure that out for people. So it's probably safer to get the vaccine to be on the safe side. And it's important to keep following questions. public. Yeah, it's important to keep following public health guidance, masks, social distancing, and washing your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirshner. And we are getting many questions, so we are going to go to Sun Lakes. Uh, Sun Lakes, we have uh, Donna. Donna, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. My question is, um, I have uh, remitting relapsing multiple sclerosis. I've had it since 1969. I do not take any kind of uh, beta serums or any kind of medication. I control it with diet and exercise and rest. I also have colitis, and my question is, is there a recommendation that one of these vaccines in this situation might be more effective than another? <laughs> that, Ross, that's, that's a good question. Another question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're taking that to me? I, uh, um, <laughs> I'm, not aware. Okay, so I'm not aware that one is better than, than the other. Uh, right now, there are only two that are available. The both messenger RNA, the both very similar. Uh, I would talk to your primary care doctor about that. That's a very specific question, and your case is unique to you. So talk to your talk to your the primary care doctor, whoever's ca caring for your uh, your problems, and uh, have a conversation. All right. And then, and then just so you know, I actually do know some people that have MS that have been talking to their physicians. You may want to look and talk to them also, because if you have a history of responding to a certain type of vaccine in the past, for example, the Johnson & Johnson is a different platform than what the mRNA is. The Johnson & Johnson uses something called an adenovirus. So it uses another altered virus, and some people can't tolerate that when they have underlying conditions. So it is important to talk to your physician. The mRNA may be the way to go versus the Johnson & Johnson or the AstraZeneca. So that's definitely a physician conversation you want to have to make sure that you pick the right one, given your unique medical history. Thank you for those recommendations. We are going to mix it up a little bit, and we've got some questions coming in on Facebook. And we have a question from Jan. It says, I have been told that if pos it is possible for an individual that has been inoculated that can they can spread the virus like typhoid. Uh, and uh, others. Is this misinformation? Uh, it's kind of uh, we don't know. So one thing that we're trying to figure out is that while you're protected from the virus, what, and Dr. Fauci has actually gone on a lot and said this, what we don't know is that do you have enough virus if you get exposed to it that you're still able to transmit it to others? They're still figuring that out. That is why all of us continue to advocate for the mask wearing, the physical distancing, 
even after you've been inoculated. So no, you're not gonna go around and kind of be a super spreader yourself, uh, but we still are figuring out if you have the ability to do that. Uh, hopefully not, but that data is not readily available yet. They focus on first protecting the individual. Now they're looking to see, can you spread it? So do you have virus particles in your nose and throat that when you speak, you're giving it out to people? We don't know yet, to be honest. And so that's why we recommend the mask wearing and everything uh, so you don't accidentally give it to someone potentially. Yeah, and we know that many of the, of the people who have gotten uh, symptomatic disease received it from people who had the virus but were asymptomatic. Asymptomatic spreaders were clearly one of the major ways this disease has uh, wandered around the world. Great. Uh, we also have a question from Bob. And the question is uh, about Merck Pharmaceutical. Uh, it says Merck dropped out of a vaccine production as it did not have positive results. Does this impact any of the distribution plans that may have included them? Not that I'm aware of. I can tell you that the government did a good job of buying, like I said, doses from everywhere. Uh, so this is what happens when you throw a whole lot of money at this. this is, it's good, we get access to things. So my understanding, they bought a couple hundred million doses from each company. So you add Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Novavax, Johnson & Johnson, you start getting into higher numbers. So Merck not being able to, they were not as far as on my radar as one of the ones that were ahead of the game. If you notice, I haven't mentioned them. We weren't really mentioning them before. So the other ones are on path. So I don't anticipate there being any impact because almost they never were really there to be counted to begin with. Uh, if more show up, great. I'd rather have an abundance than a lack of, but I don't see it interfering with the distribution plans from what I understand right now. Very good. We are going to go now back to the phones and we're going to go to Tucson. And in Tucson, we have Edna. Edna, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Go ahead, Edna. Yes, I have a lot of medical problems. Um, and I was told my immune system is very low as I also use methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. I have heart failure and lung cancer. So should I take the vaccine? You need to talk to your 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 physician who are taking care of you. You have an individual case. Uh, I think they have to make that decision for you, help you with that decision. Uh, it's not something that uh, I can recommend either way. It okay. is one that your personal doctor has to make uh, an evaluation and a recommendation. Okay, that's what Thank I thought. Her. But but since you guys are on the phone, okay, I better jump in <laughs> and just question you guys. <laughs> but okay. Right. Thank you, Edna, for your Thank it's you. good to ask. Now we're going to move on, and we're going to Chandler. And in Chandler, we have uh, Raymond. Oh, Raymond, can you me. hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, my oh, question: please. Well, my wife and I are both in our 80s. We were lucky enough to get an appointment clear out in uh, Stadium uh, in Glendale, which is about between 50 and 60 miles from us. Do we have to go back to the same place to get our second shot? Hmm. Right now, yes. But there, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about, can we find ways to not have people to do that? Um, I don't know if those logistics have been worked out yet. So the current answer is you go back to the same place because they're trying to track it for everyone. But I do know that very problem you bring up is the traveling and all, everything like that. So that's another one I could follow with DHS about, uh, seeing have they evolved any further. They were hesitant before, again, just to make sure they knew what was going where. Uh, but the hope is that over time we can loosen that up and let you go more local because yeah, that's that's a haul to do that twice. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an appointment for your second shot? Uh, we don't have them on the line anymore. We got dropped. Okay. Uh, if you have an appointment, I would say take it. It's worth the trip. Yeah. Excellent. Good recommendations there. We are going to go this time to Yuma, and in Yuma we have uh, Joe. Joe, can you hear us? Yes, this is Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, uh, the, my wife and I are both in our 80s. 
And the last question there was uh, somewhat answered it. We got our first shot on January the 11th. And getting an appointment for the second shot here at the Yuma County is, is very difficult. Haven't got one yet, don't seem to foresee. The question is, what if it's four or five months between the two shots? Is that uh, effective or, or should you start over? And the second question is, if you have it, uh, do you have to take Moderma? What if the Johnson & Johnson one dose shot comes along in about a month? Can you just go to that instead of completing with Moderma? Well, the recommendations that I have read and seen is that you stay with the same uh, uh, drug that you've gotten the first time. So if you've got uh, Moderna vaccination, you should get a second Moderna vaccination. And I know that Yuma County has had a really hard time with the numbers of cases and the lack of vaccine availability. But hopefully that will start improving, and uh, you should stay with it and keep trying. Go back to where you got your first shot, get a second shot of Moderna, and get it as soon as you can. And then the CDC recently came out, and this has been a little bit of a discussion. It's not based a lot on a ton of data, because there's been a lot of discussion overseas about this. But the CDC says, CDC says in extreme situations, you could likely stretch that out to six weeks. Months, probably not. But six weeks, you're saying, maybe okay. And about the uh, mixing, they said potentially Pfizer and Moderna, you can get one versus the other since they're both mRNA. But I agree, once you start changing to all different courses of, of how the vaccine works, it probably is not going to work. Ideally, you want to do the same one twice and within the time limit or close to it. But if you delay it by a couple of weeks, they're saying it probably is okay. Um, but we're not 100% sure how effective it would be versus getting it right on time. But I would keep at it and calling. I, and again, I feel everyone's frustration. If it makes you feel better, the people at DHS went through the same process trying to get their own family members signed up. So they are firsthand understanding. And just to give them a little credit, I like to, I said I blame the state for all of it. It turned out the state signed, uh, teamed up with Google to make the website. So uh, I'm, now we can be mad at Google too for some of the issues they're having, I guess. But the, I guess so many people want to get the vaccine, which is great, but it is overloading their servers. So I would keep at it because you will get through at some point. And uh, there's a question that came in on Facebook that it's, uh similar along the, the, the lines of the last question, but uh, it says that the Arizona DHS uh, pod map looks pretty good, but still the process is to click on each pod, go into the registration site, go through some of, all, of or all the, the registration process, only to find out that the, uh, that the site has no openings. This is very frustrating. Can the map note if vaccines are available or better, a search that consolidates availability across all states and lets you to I really like that suggestion. I'm going to tell DHS that tomorrow. So I'm going to steal that, that comment and make that suggestion. <laughs> and that I know that they. Comment. Absolutely. And just to, just to note, they are updating the website um, to make the fixes. And I know that some of that was supposed to be um, be fixed on Friday at noon, um, but unfortunately, no appointments are available. So. I, I will say the State Farm site has appointments through February already filled, and they have appointments as busy as 2 a.m. as they do at 2 p.m. right now. Yeah, but keep checking the county websites because they do uh, continue to update as they get vaccines as well. All right, Dana, we have uh, many questions still uh, on the queue here, and we have about 10 minutes left on the town hall. So we're going to do a speed round, and we're going to go real fast to Tucson. In Tucson, we have Linda. Linda, go ahead with your question, please. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, we Hello? Can. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I'm 73 years old with a pre-existing condition of a, of a pulmonary problem, which, which two doctors have told me I am at extreme risk if I get sick. However, in Pima County, they are giving the vaccine to young people, they're giving the vaccine to faculty members who aren't teaching, but they are refusing to open the vaccine up to people 65 or older. 
So my question is, is there any way that AARP or somebody can start talking to the counties about what the CDC recommendations are and getting the vaccine to the people who really need it? That's a good question for Dana. Yeah, we have been advocating um, just this, and we'll continue to advocate. We know how important it is for um, older people to get this vaccine and had conversations last week, made some suggestions. So we're going to continue the conversations and continue to advocate um, to make sure that the older people are a priority um, who have just been absolutely devastated by this coronavirus, COVID-19. And I can tell you from the medical association standpoint, we reach out, we frequently talk to the Pima County people as well. We are trying to get our physician members to be able to provide vaccines as well to expand the ability to access it. So we will continue to advocate from our end as well. Again, the rate limiting step for all of us is, is supply. Um, and right now you have like the, ba- the big healthcare systems kind of running the show down in Pima, Banner and Tucson Medical are kind of coordinating things. But we will continue to reach out as well to help advocate for you also. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to go to, uh, I believe it's Lake Havasu. And it's Sherry. Sherry, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, here, we, we have, I, I'm calling for a whole group of people who are in the 92 and down to 75 age group. None of us has had any luck getting an appointment, even getting anyone to answer the phone. The websites don't even list vaccinations, for example, Embry. Now, Embry gave shots on Saturday, but no one knows how you were able to sign up for that. Uh, Apparently, they're friends of friends or some special sort of treatment. In the meantime, there are no slots open anywhere to get a shot. And no one has any answers, whether it's Albertsons or whatever. CVS and Walgreens are not giving shots to the general public. They are only inoculating people who are in convalescent homes or in special facilities, care facilities. They are not not inoculating the general public. So we are stuck. All of us are stuck. And we wondered if anyone knew about a pencil and paper and if they could write down the name of the person and their age and their phone number, and then simply call them back and going through the list, tell them when to appear for their shot. And if they don't appear at that time, they have to start the process for reservation all over again. Seems so simple, but none of these people has a computer and we're stuck with the phones and no one will even answer. You can imagine how frustrating anyone, that is. Anybody want to pick that? I, I, I can imagine how frustrating that is. I, I mean, I apologize on behalf of everyone who hasn't answered. Um, this is a unfortunately an issue with the logistical issues that we can bring back. Uh, again, this is feedback I can provide. Uh, I know ARP can provide. Um, and we keep on pushing because they need more people. This is what the hope for the, these federal packages are to provide resources for this very problem. Uh, one issue has been, unfortunately, and I'm not making excuses for anyone, let me be clear, but our county and state departments were asked to do this on top of everything else they're doing, but they didn't get any additional funds to do it. It's not hard to have a person answer a phone, but if, you only, if that person is also doing 14 other things, you're not going to speak to anyone. You should be able to speak to someone, but that requires the resources to do it. So we can work with them and try to remind them and advocate to get more bodies on phone, something simple like that, to help get you talking to someone. I mean, I can imagine how frustrating that is. And I do know Thank that you. they are, that I do know that they are adding more people for the phones because we've been advocating, um, knowing that there are so many people who do not have computers and they cannot be left behind, and we will continue our advocacy efforts for sure. Dana, we have less than five minutes, so we're going to speed it up a little bit. We're going to go to Casa Grande, and we have uh, Donna. Donna, can you hear us? Hello, this is Donna. Go ahead, please. Uh, 
I was just wondering. Now, my doctor told me as soon as he could, he would give me the shot. Well, I've called him now, and the, the clinic is a private clinic, so they said they'll probably be the last ones to get it. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I'm 83 years old. I've had two strokes in the last year. I've had a kidney transplant. I've got a very rare blood disease, and I'm a diabetic, and I'm wondering if I should even keep trying to get the shot. Or because yeah, you, yeah you, you need to keep trying to get it either from your, your physician's office or from uh, one of the pharmacies or on uh, one of the websites. But you clearly, you're someone who needs the uh, COVID vaccine. Don't give up. Absolutely. Don't give up there. We have uh, Jeff in Phoenix. Uh, can you hear us, Jeff? Jeff, can you hear us? Jeff is not on the line. So we're going to go to the last call, and we're going to go to Scottsdale. And in Scottsdale, we have Robin. Hi. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, I like the lady that uh, was talking about representing that group of people because she was had some of the same issues that I do. Uh, I got my first dose when the B group opened up. They sent us to Chandler. Uh, we were not able to get a uh, an appointment for the second dose, and now uh, I try. I have tried every day since the 14th of January to sign up for my second dose. No luck. Now I go through. I'm to the middle of March, and there's nothing. So uh, I'm very, very frustrated. I've got. We spend hours a day on this. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six phone numbers that I'm that I'm calling for help. I can't get a call back. I've emailed for help. I can't get an email response. I've called Maricopa County and emailed them. I've called the Arizona Department of Health Services. And then every couple of days, I get this nice letter saying, congratulations, you've had your first dose. Now, now you need your second one. So sign up. Thank you very much. So does AARI need to speak to somebody that can help me schedule something? Does AARP, you have an advocate? Do they have a phone number that somebody could help us? I'm 79, he's 84. Uh, we would drive anywhere, any time of the day, as far as we have to go to get the second dose. Our second dose is due February 4th. Can you help me? Dana, any suggestions? Um, from my understanding, what's supposed to happen is when you leave now, they're giving you an appointment. There are people who left with, who didn't get an appointment. If this was in Maricopa County, I believe you are in Scottsdale, the Department of Health is supposed to be giving you a call um, to set up that second appointment. So there is a vaccine waiting for you. Um, we know that you need to get the appointment. I know it may not be the answer that you want or need, but you definitely will get it. And if you don't get it by February 4th, um, the doctor can comment about that. Well, again, also there's a little, I'm, I'm sorry again, your frustration. I can, just hearing the, the story gets me frustrated for you. Um, again, I can go back in my role also and remind the, the state and the county that we have people that are not getting responses and we need to get them taken care of. Uh, as we talked about, you have a little more of a window than, than we think it was regarding when to get it. But yes, the sooner to the date is better. So I would keep on, you know, keeping uh, waiting for those phone calls, reaching out. We will reach out from our end um, and see if we can help remind them that they have to get a hold of these people because they're keeping a track of everyone who's gotten one. So they know when you've got it and they know when your next dose is. So. Um, I will do some reminding tomorrow if that's okay. Yeah, the, the, Thank you so much system, for the question. The system is getting updated. It clearly is clunky. Um, I got my shot on the 16th of January. It was my 85th birthday. Uh, that was my birthday present. And I was able to schedule a second shot right there in that 15-minute window waiting after the shot. Uh, but they stopped doing that. 
now they are doing it. Uh, but I'm getting that same nice email from the Department of Health Services saying, congratulations, you got your first shot, sign up for your second. So clearly the systems aren't uh, speaking to each other yet. So Ross, if you're talking to Dr. Chris, you might fill her in on some of the conversations today because they're, uh, they're heartbreaking. And clearly we need to do better. Yeah, I, I will get Absolutely. all this information up the up the food chain. Um, I'm really good at being a nudge, so I'll do that tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. I wish we had more time for more more questions. Dana, I'm going to have to turn it back to you. Thank you, Alex. On behalf of AARP Arizona, I want to say thank you to everyone for taking part in today's telephone town hall discussion on the coronavirus pandemic. We've been talking with Dr. Ross Goldberg and Dr. Lynn Kirshner, and thank you for joining today. As we near the end of our call, um, would either well, I don't think we actually have time for any any other remarks. Um, in the face of this crisis, we're providing information and resources to help older adults and those caring for them protect themselves from the virus, prevent its spread to others while taking care of yourself. For more information about the coronavirus in Arizona, you can go to aarp.org forward slash AZ, or you can call 1-888-687-2277. Thank you for participating in the discussion on this important topic. We apologize if we were not able to answer your questions. You can also obtain valuable information through AARP publication on our website at aarp.org or by calling 1-888-687-2277. Thank you, and this concludes the call. Goodbye.